There was, there was an older theory that was put forth, it was, it was pretty popular in the 18 and, and 1900s, and, and even fairly late, that said the reason Revelation is so weird and bizarre is because it's written in code. And by understanding the code, and Bruce Metzger was a big proponent of this, he's one of the top New Testament scholars who ever lived, his study on Revelation was called breaking the code. And it was said that John was in exile, Christians were persecuted, so in order to keep persecution down, any subversive language against the empire would need to be coded so that people couldn't, so that, so that only the insiders would get it. And those who were on the outside, those who were enemies of God's people, they wouldn't be able to recognize it and they'd pass it along and, and be safe. And more, most Revelation commentators and scholars for the past probably 50 years or so have, have sort of I don't want to say dismissed, but they've seen that as, as not a great explanation. The main reason is because the, if, if the symbol, if the code, if this is written in code, it's not very well hidden code. Because as we see, when we see the woman in the next, the, the harlot, the whore of that one, another image of this beast and of the emperor, it's going to explicitly say the woman rise, seated on seven hills. And everybody in the world knew Rome was the city of seven hills. Um, the, even, even 666 and the geometry, that, that doesn't take a ton of background knowledge to understand in this culture, in this time period. So while it's possible that Revelation may contain coded language, um, the idea that that's the secret to understanding it and, and that these Romans would read it and go, I have no idea what this is about, when it's painting them vividly in, in descriptions that they would recognize, it's, it's not seen as plausible. Uh, especially the modern commentators. So, but Bruce Metzger, if you want someone who really develops that, his breaking the code revelation. I think Dad's got the study in his office for the book, but, and it's a good study. I mean, that's one of the first revelation studies I ever did. He's got a lot of good in it. But. So, what we see then as we're moving through is the, this unholy Trinity has been revealed. The the characters have been unmasked, so to speak. The players in the game have been identified, and. The, 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 the situation has been set in terms of this cosmic battle imagery. So now that these beasts have arisen, just like in Daniel, once these beasts arose and were given the power and the authority to conquer God's people, Daniel saw a vision of a coming son of man who would once and for all exercise his authority over these beasts and judge them. So that's what we expect to find in Revelation, is we've seen the beasts, we've seen them persecuting God's people, now, where's the Son of Man? He's in chapter 14. John said, oh, oh by the way, real quick, before we move on to that, 666. Good grief, a number of things have been written on 666. Uh, 666 isn't magical. You, you don't have to, uh, I know somebody who was going to buy something at a gas station or something like that, and the total ended up being 666. And so they bought another piece of gum or something, so it wouldn't be six. You know, like I don't have anything to do with that number. And th I mean, that's just superstition. That's that. There's nothing biblical. Um, some people don't get six 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 on their license plate or, or, or their address or so, I don't know. All of that comes from believing the the belief that's put forward that that six 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 is some future or reference to some future mark that people will get unknowingly. And that that will mark them as the people of the beast, and then God's judgment will fall on them when it does happen during the tribulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in Revelation, what we see is the people who bear the mark of the beast are those who dwell on the earth. And throughout Revelation, those who dwell on the earth is language, technical terminology for those who are not following the Lamb. And those who are following the Lamb already have a mark on their heads. It's the seal of the Lamb that we saw in chapter 7. 144,000 are already sealed with the mark of the Lamb on their foreheads. So in Revelation imagery, if the Lamb seals his people and the beast is a parody of the Lamb, the Antichrist is a knockoff version, a false version of the Lamb, then of course he's going to have his mark too. And his mark will be one in which if you're not in with the beast, you're not going to be able to participate in his world system, which includes buying and selling and all of that stuff, which in first century Rome would have meant, meant the trade guilds and, and the, the, the economic life of the city. 
So what is the 666 symbolism for today? What does that, do we need to watch out for credit card chips that they're going to put in our forehead or on our hands? Should we you know, not give our social security number? Or any, there's no need to even look into all that. It's very simple. If you don't have the mark of the lamb, you're wearing the mark of the beast. Or if you, are, if you are supporting, upholding, or contributing to any system or empire or organization or company or anything that declares itself to be in the place of God and openly persecutes God's people, you're wearing the mark of the beast. And, and the whole purpose of Revelation is to repent, come out of her, get away from the beast, take the mark of the lamb, follow the lamb wherever he goes, not the beast. So people have seen throughout the centuries that even though this may be describing in its setting first century Roman politics that the first Christians were living under, the application of these principles reverberates throughout history. And any empire that comes on the scene that's wearing the beastly dress is probably the beast reincarnated or, or revisited. And ultimately at the end, maybe there will be one final beast, one final capital A Antichrist, one final evil nation. And, and, and maybe it will literally make people take a mark and worship and all that. But it won't be this secret unknown thing that Christians have to wonder, oh, have I taken the mark of the beast? Uh, because Christians know I'm sealed with the blood of the Lamb. So it's one or the other. Um, the question we have is which do we live under? Whose mark do we bear every day? Every decision we make is a chance to show <laughs> Are we part of the 144,000, or are we part of those who dwell on the earth? The Revelation is an ongoing challenge. Well, speaking of the 144,000, guess who appears? Chapter 14, then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Ta-da! Here is the counterpart to the beast and those who had his mark. I also heard a sound coming out of heaven, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. Now the sound I heard was like that made by harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with, women's, with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from humanity as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their lips, for they are blameless. Now, we have imagery that for Jewish readers of the first century would immediately bring to mind an event that they knew well. That was the event of Exodus after Israel crossed the Red Sea. After Israel crossed the sea and was safely on the other side, and, and the sea had closed in on Pharaoh and had destroyed the captor of God's people, then you have a whole chapter with the Song of Moses. And then Miriam leads the, the women in, in procession of singing the Song of Moses about the horse and the rider being cast into the sea. And Israel is, it's once again the church is being painted as if it's Israel in the Old Testament. As if the church is being seen to visualize itself in the same way that Israel was called to visualize itself after the exodus and the victory of God's people. And so Israel standing by the sea, the faithful followers of the Lamb, the army of Israel is standing with their leader and their general, the Lamb. But this isn't a regular army armed for battle. Rather, it says these are ones who have not defiled themselves with women for their virgins. So now, does that mean that all God's people, that sex is bad and only virgins can be in God's army, etc.? No. This is a reference back to the fact that in battle preparations in ancient Israel, one of the ways you ceremonially prepared yourself to go out as God's army into battle was abstaining from sex beforehand. And Deuteronomy 20 and Deuteronomy 23, 9 and 10 give this prohibition, this commandment to Israel. And then 1 Samuel 21, 5 and 2 Samuel 11, 11 both reference this event when David talks about his men refraining. When Uriah refuses to sleep with Bathsheba because he's preparing, he's in battle, he can't defile himself. And so David has him killed so he can take Bathsheba. This was a practice in Israel. The ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes and they're redeemed from humanity as first fruits to God harkens back to the Lamb being the one who had redeemed and ransomed people from all nations. Again, identifying this army of Israelites as the representation of all of God's people. 
who are faithful, and no lie was found in their lips, for they are blameless. That is almost definitely a play on the motif that we've seen throughout Revelation of the need to be a faithful witness. Because what's the one thing that will ruin someone's witness in a courtroom is if they lie or if they're known as being a liar. And the thing that separates a faithful witness from an unfaithful or an untrue witness in a courtroom is one's telling the truth and one's not. And so the reference of them, no lie being found on their lips and being blameless, is they are the ones who follow the Lamb where He goes. He was the faithful witness, they are faithful witnesses. He told the truth about who He was, they tell the truth about who He is. He went to His own death, they are called also to go to their own death. And as we saw in chapter 7, the 144,000 are the ones who were pictured as the great multitude who had come out of the great tribulation. In other words, every time the beast knocks down and destroys God's people, his faithful people, that is, that is their exaltation into the heavenly reign and rule with their conquering, victorious Lord and general, the Lamb. So it's getting, it, Revelation again, it turns everything on its head. It's getting, it's pulling back the curtain and getting the first century readers to hear, you may be dying, you may be um, losing your job, you may be facing starvation or economic ostracization, you may lose your life, but if you're doing it as a faithful witness, that is the means by which you are conquering. And in the end, the beast won't get the last laugh. The dragon won't get the last laugh. God's people will rejoice. And so it's a very powerful image, this, this picture of the 144,000 standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Because in the Old Testament prophets, the frequent motif was judgment will go out from Zion. When God wage, wages war on the day of the Lord and judges the nations and, and vindicates the faithful, he'll do so from Mount Zion. And so now John sees this image of them standing on Mount Zion. And then as if to punctuate it, he sees another angel, verse 6, flying directly overhead, who had an eternal gospel. And this is the one time, in the New, in one of the few times in the New Testament where that word gospel is used. And here it's used to describe what he's going to say. He's flying directly overhead. He had an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. Even the ones who have taken the mark of the beast, those who live on the earth still are not beyond the reach of God. They're still the call before the final judgment. It's like God is delaying and delaying and delaying this final judgment that we know has been ready to happen all the way since the seven seals were opened. But yet, he's still giving another chance, proclaiming the gospel to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Verse 7 declares in a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has arrived, and worship the one who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And then a second angel follows, the first one, declaring, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great city. She made all the nations drink of the wine of her immoral passion. And then a third angel follows the first two and declares in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and takes the mark on his forehead or his hand, that person will also drink the wine of God's anger that had been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath, and he will be tortured with fire and sulfur in front of the holy angels and in front of the Lamb. And the smoke from their torture will go up forever and ever. And those who worship the beast in his image will have no rest day or night along with anyone who receives the mark of his name. This requires steadfast endurance of the saints, those who obey God's commandments and hold to their faith in Jesus. So, not once, not twice, but three times Right as it seems like God's about to render judgment, again, he gives this warning, he gives this cry of, of, that, that his people would repent. And he uses the graphic and the violent and the terrifying image of eternal torment apart from him. And people who read this straight out of the, their, the Precious Moments Bible that they normally read that has everything nice and sweet and sappy, they think of Jesus and heaven and God as like a big Thomas Kincaid painting. and Everything's fuzzy and nice and pastel and... But what you see is Revelation is serious because it wasn't just that Christians were being called names or that Christians weren't getting the best jobs and they were being given to non-Christians. Christians were being killed for their faith. 
Families had to watch as their mothers or their children were taken from them, sewn up in animal skins, and thrown in the Colosseum for lions and tigers to eat at the halftime show for the gladiator games. I mean, Christians had to watch. Nero lit his backyard barbecue feasts by taking Christians, tying them to a pole, covering them in pitch, and lighting them on fire. That provided the light for his gardens. This is serious stuff. The destroyers of the earth will face judgment. And Revelation does present startling images of judgment because to present it in any way less than as horrific and, and as, as awful as the fate that awaits those who rebel against God, who set themselves up against God, and who destroy God's people, to present it as anything less than that would, not, would be to not do justice to the seriousness with which God's people were being persecuted. And that's why apocalyptic imagery as a whole, which is usually written to people who are undergoing persecution, is often filled with images of violence and vengeance and destruction. And it's never capricious, it's never arbitrary, it's never against those who don't deserve it or those who are innocent. It's always in the end directed at those who deliberately continue to set themselves up against God and continue to side with the beast, the dragon, Satan. It's very stark. It's supposed to smack the reader in the face. It's supposed to strike fear into the hearts of those who don't know who they follow, whether they do follow the Lamb or not. On the flip side, it's very comforting for those who are being put to death, who do have to face the Colosseum, who do risk their lives daily for the Gospel. The image that God will bring justice is one that provides comfort for them because they know that what they suffer is not in vain know that their message, their faithful witness does not go unnoticed, and evil doesn't have the last laugh. So it's a very, it's a very stark, and, and, and this is a good old-fashioned fire and brimstone Baptist sermon text right here, that, that you know, this, this, as they say in seminary, this will preach. Um, this is the kind of stuff that Jonathan Edwards and John Wesley and, and the theologians throughout the age have used, and, and revivalists have used to preach, because it can find its target today in people who do oppose God's people. So, it's a call, and it's, and it's the funny thing is it's called the eternal gospel, the good news. That's again the irony of Revelation. The good news is for those who are against God and who refuse to turn to God, in the end it will be very, very bad news. But for those who do recognize God, who do give Him glory, who do realize He is the one true God, I'm God. He is everything that I need to follow. It is the best news possible. And so he ends this section by assuring his congregation, assuring them, uh, encouraging them to persevere, die for the lamb rather than serve the beast. Because in the end, it will be worth it. And that takes faith to believe. Because everything in the world at the time would seem to say the opposite. And that takes steadfast endurance, from verse 12. And then he gives even more reason for them to believe that. Verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead, those who die in the Lord from this moment on, or those who die in the Lord assuredly. There's a question whether it should be translated either or, so I put them both. Yes, says the Spirit, so they can rest from their hard work because their deeds will follow them. And this brings us back to that image of the breaking of the fifth seal where those who had died for the testimony are seen as being under the altar crying out and they're given long white robes and they're told to rest until the full number is brought in. So in the meantime, John, what John hears from heaven, not just John, but he hears a voice now and his congregations would have heard this, is if you die in the Lord, you don't die in vain. You rest with the Lord until he's put everything right. And he's not done until all evil is once and for all destroyed. But in the meantime, those who go to be with him and have maintained their faithful witness, they rest from their works. Their deeds follow them. Their deeds accompany them into heaven. In other words, the righteous, faithful witness to Jesus on earth receives the welcome into the heavenly presence of well done, good and faithful servant. And so this is the reason, these kind of, this kind of thinking and understanding was the reason why Paul could have so much hope in his late letters that he writes to Timothy. 
and, and could speak about going on to be with the Lord and, and have a genuine lack of fear when it came to death because he's knowing that even if he's away from them and out of the body, he'd be present with Christ. And that one day then, when Christ returns, he would raise up the body, he would, everyone would be transformed, the heavens would be renewed, all of the promises would be kept from the Old Testament about restoring creation, etc. So it's a very um, uh, promising ending to this section. It's, it's a, it ends again with a heavenly voice of hope. And now, judgment time. Verse 14, this next section is going to be two harvests that are depicted. Verse 14, then I looked and a white cloud appeared and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. He had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple, shouting in a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and start to reap, because the time to reap has come, since the earth's harvest is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, people have seen in this, one on the Son of Man, as a combination, this image of Joel, chapter 3, it speaks of harvesting the grain and the grapes. Also of Isaiah 63 and of Daniel 7. And in all of those, there's this imagery of the Son of Man and, and the final judgment and the harvesting of the earth. And is this could this be referring to in Matthew 13, 24 through 30, part of the parable about the kingdom of God, about the field being full of wheat and weeds. And he said, at the end of the age, the Son of Man will send his angels to harvest. They'll tie up and they'll take the weeds and they'll throw them into the fire and be burned, but they'll gather the wheat and take it into my father's house. So what a number of commentators have seen is this harvest imagery first is, is not depicting the, the swinging of the sickle isn't a judgment image. It's a harvesting. The harvest is ripe. The people of God have grown. The mustard seed has grown to its full capacity. The field is ripe. And so Jesus is seeing to it that none of his followers who are on the earth are, are, are judged wrongly. None of them are judged as, none of them make it to the next harvest, which is most commentators see as the bad harvest, the one you don't want. So, so ideally, you, you, you'd want to be part of this harvest. Then, verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, and he too had a sharp sickle. Another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar and called out in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes off the vine of the earth, because its grapes are now ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the grapes from the vineyard of the earth and tossed them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Then the winepress was stalked outside the city and blood poured out of the winepress up to the height of a horse's bridle for a distance of almost 200 miles, or 1,600 stadia. This image now is one that is there, there are Old Testament passages that talk about the, the, the wine press of God, wine press of God's fury or God's wrath. And, and you know, the way a wine press works, do you know, I remember the old I Love Lucy episode where they're stomping grapes? And, uh, it, it, that's a wine press, you know? You, you grow in the grapes and then you just stomp on them until they turn into mush. And all of the juice from the grapes flows out of the, the um, vat at the bottom and you collect that to make the wine. And the rest that's left is just gross mushed up pulp that's useless. Well, that was the image of judgment that was uh, the Old Testament prophets sometimes would speak of as God talking about that. You know, throwing them into the wine press of God's fury. And so, that possibly could be an illusion. At least one commentator, among a number of others, but G.B. Care, he said, actually, if you think about it, though, this may not be necessarily a judgment in that sense. This may be describing the flip side of following Jesus, following the Lamb, which is being trampled upon and having your blood as the blood of the martyr flow throughout the earth because of refusing to submit. So, so there's a small, I, I think a small percentage of people have seen in both of these harvests as being the fate of believers. But the majority, other scholars have seen it as the first harvest is God gathering his people. And, and then the flip side of that is God destroying the wicked. So, th so this represents a, a, a twofold image of final judgment, two sides of the same coin. 
the separating of the sheep and the goats, or the good fish and the bad fish, or the wheat and the weeds. 